We all know that real estate has created more millionaires than any other industry on the planet. We also know that it has created a lot of heartache due to mismanagement, overborrowing, and just simple life events that happen to all of us. Welcome to the Cash Flow Pro Podcast. My name is Casey Brown, and I am your fearless leader. And although we might be bourbon sipping and at times foul mouth Southerners, we will always do our best to be honest, straightforward, and due diligent with all of the information we pass along to you. Welcome to the show. Hey there, and welcome to today's episode of Cashflow Pro, your daily real estate investing podcast and YouTube channel. I'm here today with Tamar Hermes, right? Did I get that right? You did. Uh, she actually has come to us today, and we're going to chat a little bit about uh, her being uh, GPs on some different deals. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we want to talk about what the how she vets her sponsors, how she looks uh, at, at them and through what lens are the are, are, are things identified that are most important to her. Um, so tomorrow, welcome to the show. And how are you today? I'm doing just great. And uh, the weather is cool down in Austin, Texas. So I'm pretty happy camper. Yeah, I tell you, uh, Austin, Texas, man, you're talking about a market that, my gosh, I, I, it seems to be the never-ending real estate investment arena, I guess. Yeah, we have a lot of fun over here, for sure. Uh, definitely, we're seeing some prices flattening. It's not as crazy as it was, but uh, nothing's being given away around around sure. these parts. Yeah, I understand. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what got you started in real estate and real estate investing and, and we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm pretty much a veteran at this point. I've been investing for a couple decades and I started out because I wanted to stop trading my time for money. I was an executive in television and just realized that even though I liked my job, if I stopped working at that job, I would also stop having income come in. So for me, uh, cash flow was uh, was part of what I was thinking about, and also I uh, was also at that time really just thinking about how to lower my expenses and uh, okay. earning buying properties and ha owning assets definitely gives you the opportunity to to have more choices in terms of how you live your life. And so that was really how yep. it started. It started with a duplex in Los Angeles uh, a couple of decades ago. Awesome. And so, you know, you make so many different points there, valid points, especially because I, I do a, a video um, on my website about trading time for money where I'm just like, listen, you can pay your bills and, not have to make that directly associated with how much time you spend on something. And it's so, it's like, it's almost became like second nature to me at this point where that's all like, I'm, I'm like, Hey, how can we help you get out of the rat race? How can we help you? You said you left an executive position. I mean, and, and obviously, I mean, how can we get these people to understand that cash flow is like, that's, you can get paid for doing nothing. And it's just, anyway, it's just that that's one of the things I think that, that we just as a, as a society and as people trying to spread the word like myself uh, struggle with. Yeah, I think that we're not trained, we're not conditioned to think about the opportunities that we have in terms of creating businesses or obviously real estate where you can have people paying bills for you and income coming in steadily. And we're, as kids, we're basically taught, hey, go get a job and find a good profession. Yep. And then before you know it, it, you may love that profession and that's great. And no one says that you shouldn't keep doing it. It's just that if you decide you don't want to do that, then you want to be able to have choices to walk away from it. If you're in a situation where you want to move states or you're in a situation where you want to uh, have um, send your kids to a certain kind of school or pay for a certain kind of medical care. You want to be able to do that. And so you don't want to be a prisoner to the income that you receive from your profession. And that is sure. really the reason that, that cash flow is something 
that's definitely worth focusing on. I was actually an investor where my husband and I loved our careers um, and we still do. So we didn't really focus as much on cash flow early on. We were really focused on on just building an asset column and having steady investments. And then the cool thing was that because slow and steady bought correctly in in real estate works very well over time, I was able, as soon as I decided, okay, now I want cash flow to sell a couple assets and float that into really great cash flowing vehicles. And so uh, you can create opportunities and pivot and have a lot of choices as long as that asset column is going. That's one of the reasons why I'm not a huge fan of flippers only flipping. I'm always encouraging flippers to hold on to some property because otherwise really when you flip something, you might make a lot of money, but it's really a job. Then you've got to go find another property to flip. I tell you, matter of fact, I did a podcast not long ago with a friend of mine from a mastermind that we're both in. And that was, I was on his podcast, as a matter of fact, and that's what we were like, I just really couldn't hit after that enough. I was like, you know, cause see, I come from a real estate agent sales background. Right. And, and, and a lot of times people, it's probably the biggest career that people just like flakily get into. And they're like, Oh my God, these people are making six, eight, 10, 15, $20,000 commissions. And I need to be doing that because I can do that in my spare time and whatever. Right. Um, it's that's the big craze. It seems like about every 10 or 12 years it comes around. And right now we're at the peak where everybody's getting their real estate license. And I've oftentimes said they need to make it a little, the test a little bit harder because some of these people I'm like, wow, you know how to breathe. Right. So well, what I'm getting at is, is I myself would make 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, even I, I made commissions up to like 120,000 at one hit. Right. And the thing is, is that I would make that. And the problem was I was just as broke with that as I was before that, because at the same time, it it wasn't until I finally figured out, I'm like, okay, if you can take this, you need to go put your money down on something, buy it down and then make the cash flow difference in what you, your note to the bank. And it, so that's kind of where I started. It's the same thing. It's, and, and, uh, I actually have, have a saying with, with one of my products that we give away, um, is turn your massive income into passive income. And that is kind of where we leave it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think that, uh, it, w the point that, that you bring up what I really take away from it has to do with regardless of how much money you're making, you also really want to be a store of your money because you need to be able to budget, especially when you're buying real estate, you need to be able to really uh, have reserves and be, uh, be responsible in terms of what the mortgage payments are and the commitments that you make financially. And so you do need to watch how you're spending which is uh, really um, uh, something that is really critical. So if you don't have that in order, get your financial house in order first to make sure that right. everything's suited. And that's a really a great pivot too, in terms of what we wanted to talk about from GP or LP uh, experiences. So LP being the limited partner in a syndication deal. And I know one of the things that you talk about a lot, Casey, and uh, that is to really look when you're looking at a sponsor, someone that is presenting a deal to you, make sure that the numbers make sense. That's one of the biggest issues that we're having uh, right now with this market uh, in the past 15 years is that so many people now feel like they're real estate uh, gurus and some of the numbers, the way that they've analyzed numbers is, is not necessarily realistic as the market turns. And we're starting to see a flattening. We're starting to see things differently. I mean, I have Airbnbs that aren't booking right now where that they were always booked. You know, I have, yep. uh, you know, most, you always need to be able to pivot and you need to be able to make sure that when you're looking at any kind of deal that the numbers make sense to you. So if someone says, oh, well, the rents are 500 a month, but we're going to get 900 a month. Well, where are the comps and are those comps realistic? And 
how many comps are there? And we know in this market that one thing that we're fairly certain about is this interest rates are going up, less people are buying properties. We know that rents are increasing. So we know that we are going to see increases in rents. But if we see a huge recession, bigger than you know the start of this recession as we speak now, uh, we might start to see uh, rents coming down. And are you prepared? I yeah. mean, can you still make money? Mm -hmm. If you say 500 to 800, can you make money at 700? Can you make money at 600? Or where's that break even point? So it's a break even. Your break even point is the is the biggest that's and I'll tell you, um, you know, when you start looking at some of these marketing packages and some of these things that are being put out there right now on some of these deals, um I sellers want yesterday price yesterday's prices, buyers want tomorrow's prices. And I just got off a podcast. As a matter of fact, he was on my podcast and he said that. So I want to give I want to give him credit where credit is due. So go listen to the podcast before. But that's what's going on. As of right now, mid September uh twenty twenty two, everybody is like like you almost need to be in a holding pattern right now because as we not I'm not saying if a deal pops up don't don't analyze it look at it take it but but if you are solely getting into a deal and your biggest your biggest point of I guess selling it to investors is we're going to increase the rents man as an investor it's time to be very very cautious about that and you made that you made that point and I'm not sure what you, what year did you start passive investing? When did I start passive investing? Yeah, what what year? I just yeah, because of the no, timeline. I started passive every... investing um, several years ago because I didn't want to do all the work myself, and mm -hmm. uh, it really helps lighten the load. And I would say, I mean, just in terms of being in a holding pattern, I would say be more cautious. But I mean, I haven't seen. I've seen so many good deals right now. I mean, I cannot invest enough right now. And even though I'm, tr yeah. I'm, I'm holding cash for, for a storm that we may or may not see, uh, I still feel that there are a lot of good, uh, good deals. And part of it. Well, is, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I was just going to say the risk palette there really comes down to each individual investor. If you're, if you've got, you know, if you're an accredited investor and you've got, I don't want to say limited funds, but if you're like, Hey man, I can jump into one or two really good deals right now. Um, that's obviously, it, but if you're like, Hey, I can jump into one or two really good deals right now as they present themselves and still have 300,000 in the bank to fall back on. If all else fails, that's where I think the, 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 the line gets drawn as far as like what you need to be looking at. I just, Again, I, I guess I'm cautiously optimistic about some of this stuff. I think everything's going to hold fine. I think the increases are what what need to be just kind of mitigated a little bit in underwriting. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, that comes down to how much experience does your sponsor have? And you need to ask mm -hmm. and look at, uh, you know, how many times have they successfully ran deals and how many times right. have they uh, said they were going to pay a certain amount and paid it and where are their projections maybe off. So yep. what I find is that with the more seasoned uh, people that you work with or people that, you know, just have great track records that you're, you're also betting on a horse that knows what they're doing, that knows how to run a race and understands <laughs> what market cycles look like. And so That's when you on. when you do that, then you're generally in a better situation. And the one thing that I've learned and one of the things that I really heed caution about is that investors and entrepreneurs too are extremely enthusiastic about anything that yep. they're giving you. So if you're talking to someone and they're telling you, hey, do you want to go on this deal with me? Oh my God, it's so great. This is going to, you're going to make this much money and da, 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 da. And you need to ask the question, well, what's the risk? Where's the risk? Yep. And look at that. And just know that they're generally will be honest with you about the risk. And they're still going to tell you it's the best deal since sliced bread because one, they need to raise the money, yep. make it keep working. And two is that they really believe that 
but you need to believe that based on some criteria and that has to that comes down to also educating yourself a little bit not doing things blindly and making sure you're working with really honorable people that will tell you the risk because if anyone tells you there's no risk in this then they're yeah. probably not being very honest because there's always a risk when we invest i mean it may not be a huge risk with a lot of um a lot of these investments that we make but um, but it is investing, and nobody has a crystal ball. So if anyone acts like they have one, they may not be the best partner for you. Yeah, I, I would I would uh, say somebody is now as capital raisers. You know, we're always trying to minimize the appearance of the risk, and I feel like that's probably the number one thing. That if you can minimize the appearance of the risk, but yet still very plainly say, hey, these are the risks, but these are what we're doing to mitigate them, then you need to listen a little more. But yes, if you're like, if you're with somebody and they're like, this is a risk, this is risk free, it's guaranteed, it's whatever this or there for one, it's against the law. Number two, yeah, it, that's not anything that that I, I assume you want to probably be be invested in or partnered up with but so i'd like to kind of dig in a little bit and figure i usually ask for like one of the, the few times that i've had other passive investors on here oh what, let me go back real quick so the reason i asked what year you had had started was because we had we had there's a point where I think, and I've referenced it on this show several times, that all of us that were in the market in like 9, 10, 11, 12, um, now I wasn't in it as an investor. I wasn't in it as a syndicator or anything like that. I was in it as just real, straight real estate sales. Um, man, there's, I can still driving down I-24 towards Nashville, you know, one of the hottest areas in the country right now that uh, uh, for, for investments and so on and so forth. But I can still see those big canvas draped signs over these over these massive apartment buildings that are right off i-24 that that were like free plasma screen tv with uh the signing of a one-year lease or or free water or what whatever whatever their enticement enticement was or free one month free uh rent or whatever but those those inducements to get people to come in and move into their unit to, to come in and move into their units now this is a little different because we have a we have a shortage of supply but you know i i myself maybe i'm too maybe i'm too cautious maybe i'm maybe i'm being far too cautious but i just being not very far separated from that and having very razor thin margins on some of this cash flow when you average pref payments and bank interest and insurance and the cost of everything else rising along with it. It just seems to me like, I'm like, where, where do we stop? Yeah. I mean, you know, that's always the question, right? I mean, it, you know, there's a lot of investors that we all know where in 2017, they said, I'm holding and I'm going to wait for the big crash. And they lost a lot of money because they held for a long Dang time. Right, and we yeah. had a lot more opportunities. So I just think, you know, look at the, the main thing is to just look at the deal and, and look at the opportunity cost. So at a certain point there, if you really like the deal and you're waiting and waiting and waiting, then you're also losing a lot of money, especially at 9% is what we're projecting inflation at right now, which is yep. very high. So at a certain point, you may want to jump into a deal. Maybe don't put all your cash in a deal. That's what I always think. I'm like, okay, put some money in a deal oh, and then yeah. in, in different deals that you really like and then save some. Uh, and hopefully you have certain strategies to, to uh, get that money working for you a little bit where it's still yeah. liquid so that you have some. Pick a solid average it. between two competent operators and, you know, bet that neither one of them are going to lose everything, but if one loses everything, the chances of both of them losing everything is not very good. But I mean, yeah, so, so no, that, that makes perfect sense. So um, now I want to dig in where I was going a minute ago before I had to go back and, and, and readdress where I was earlier. Um, I want to dig in a little bit. So, so I'd like you to, to maybe uh, give us three things starting with the most important second second most important third third most important things that you look at when when you are 
like vetting a deal, vetting a sponsor, deciding whether you're going to invest in this sponsor's deal at one, two, three main street, right. wherever. Um, and then, um, kind of give us maybe a little explanation, especially on the first most important one. And I, I'll tell you, I, I want to, after you're done, I want to go back and then I want to ask what, unless you, unless one of them is one of your three things, I want to ask what this other thing has to do with it. So go ahead. Okay, sure. All right. So one of the things we've already talked about is, is experience. So we really want to look at how much experience someone has and, and not only how much experience they have, but how much they have, how much experience they have in that asset class. So like, let's say I've done a lot of multifamily, but now I'm breaking into storage. So that's a new asset class. Whenever we start something new, we have a little bit of a learning curve. Doesn't mean it's not a great deal. It doesn't mean they're not going to do great with it, but it means that there's, there's a, an element that we want to pay attention to. So you want to speak to that and see like, okay, well, who have you put on your team that knows how to do mobile, um, that knows how to do storage to make sure that you are covering yourself because each asset class can have its own, uh, has its own challenges. So that's the first thing that I do. Um, I, you know, again, I also, even before I even look at a deal, I decide what my criteria is. And I think that's really important. So a lot of people just think, I just want to get cash flow. I just want to get cash flow. So you're just, you know, a lot of multifamily deals come at you. But maybe right now you're thinking, you know what? I'm a little more comfortable with what mar the market's doing to be a little bit more uh, invested in storage or in mobile home parks. So you might want to find sponsors that do those and specialize in those because uh, that can make a big difference in terms of, you know, if, if you feel like, you know, something's going to happen where the market's going to change a little bit, or a lot of people have liked industrial or, you know, different, you've got to see where the market's going in terms of where you want to put your money. So always look at that too, in terms of what my strategy is. I do look at the returns, but I won't be seduced. It's interesting. We just had this deal come up uh, with some colleagues of mine. We were looking at a couple of deals and this was really interesting. There were two uh, storage unit uh uh, uh, GPs presenting deals. One of them was paying cash, more cash flow, and uh, and had less experience. And one of them was paying less cash flow, but had more experience. And the likelihood of you losing your money with the person that was a veteran was really low. They had all recourse loans, which means that recourse means that basically if, if they have $10 million in a deal and the deal doesn't go through, then they're on the line for the $10 million. So recourse is just like- So as an investor, as an investor, you prefer to see recourse loans? Well, not necessarily recourse loans. What I, what I want to see, and this is another thing when you're betting, is skin in the game. I want to see- Either you're investing alongside the GP, the LPs. I want to see that maybe you have your own money in it. Obviously, if you have recourse, what it means to me is that if you're on the line personally for the recourse, it shows me that you really believe in the deal because they're going to come after you for the money. Um, so, uh, so it just shows me that you really um, are invested in in, um, in your processes and in your mm -hmm. in your deals that you're offering. Uh, so it was interesting how many people were seduced by, oh, but this one's going to give me 10% right away, right out the gate. But they were also newer to the asset class. So there was much more yeah. risk overall and the overall investment. There was more risk because there's, there's all kinds of things, nuances that need to be mitigated. So yep. I was definitely more inclined and am going to be investing with this storage that was not paying as much cash flow at first because I wanted right. the more stable assets. So that's another thing, like, don't be seduced by, oh, but it's cash flow. Because the truth is, like, one deal isn't going to get you to retire. You're going to have to do several deals or buy several assets in order to have the kind of money that you need in order to switch your, um, you know, be able to leave your day job if that's your goal. Because, you know, if we're yep. making, you know, even six figures on a low end, right? You, you know, you, yep. you're not going to get that if you invest a hundred thousand dollars, even at 20%, you're, you know, that's $20,000. And then if you divide it by 12, it's not, it's not enough to, to do it. So, sure. yeah. So that's, that's, uh, th that's another thing that I look at. I think that's already three. I mean, I can go on and on. There's all kinds of things that I look at. Well, I, so I want to bury here's one more that's important. Let me share this. This is an important one. You want to look at how long they're holding the deal. Okay. Because the reason is, is because 
an effective investor, to be the most effective when you're investing, is to get your principal out of the deal right away so that you can put your money into another deal. So if they're holding the deal for um, 10 years, that might be good. Like if it's in an IRA or something and you don't want the money and you don't want to have to look for another deal, you know, just let it ride. Just let it be in there and let the cash flow go up over time. But if you need your cash out sooner, that's something you want to be looking at. If they're saying, like right now, there's certain multi with multifamily is pretty popular to say, hey, at three years, we're gonna we're looking to refinance and get you back some of your capital. But with the way the market is right now, they have to exercise the option not to refinance because it may not make sense based on market conditions and the prepay penalties and all kinds of scenarios that go on. So you just want to be looking at, you know, how long you can, how long they're going to hold your money and what the projections are. That's another really important fact. So the one I want to bury in here and get, I guess, get your opinion on is not one you mentioned. And really, honestly, you're the first active passive investor that has not mentioned this. And it's, and it is, and I, I, let me preface this by saying I had a lady on my show um, about, I don't know, it's probably been a month ago. She was actively passive investing in, in, I don't know, several different deals. And I asked her the same question I asked you, what is the first thing that you look for in a deal? And I'm going to tell you her answer. And then I want to get your take on it because I want to know what, what percentage it plays in your deal. And it was, and her answer was, I trust my gut. And while it seems as, as syndicators and as, as capital raisers and so on, we sometimes get so focused on the numbers and the trends and the graphs and the this and the that and the that we forget to go back and just build trust with people now that trust or that gut stuff can still be built through what you're saying and what you weren't completely off and saying i want experience because at the same time somebody that can sit up and talk about their experience is obviously building that trust with you Mm -hmm. but what to what degree does your gut play um in or are you purely just numbers like like numbers and experience well no of course like when i said bet on the horse and i say it all comes down to relationship you know at the beginning like what's the experience has to do with you know who are the people do i trust them do i trust their honor do i trust their experience i would say i definitely look for trust when i hear trust my gut i feel like gut to me is a little bit more it's a little more internal. Like it's different. Like if I say, Hey, I have a relationship with you. I trust you. I hear what you're saying. We're communicating. We're looking at things together. That is a relatable uh, feature that I would respect in terms of analyzing a deal. When I hear trust my gut, it feels almost like we're into intuition. No, I don't use intuition. I mean, yeah, Uh, no, I, I really don't use intuition. I think it's kind of To me, and maybe when the woman said, I trust my gut, maybe she was meaning maybe more of what I'm saying in terms of trusting the people. But um, but no, I don't trust my gut at all. I think that that's not a a really, I personally uh, would say that that is not the way that I would ever invest, trusting my gut. Sure, sure. I understand. And, and, and maybe, and you're right, maybe, you know, maybe there was, there was some different, different meanings there that that maybe I missed and I know it's it's far fetched that a man could misunderstand what a what a woman on his <laughs> podcast could say. I don't think that's that that's never happened. No, I'm just kidding. I I I understand. I I I just it, it, to me it was not to me I was just I was kind of taken aback. I was like wait what? Because again as capital raisers and syndicators and and essentially marketers it, it, I mean, because that's really the, 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 the crutch of it all is marketing. Um, you know, sometimes, again, we get so drugged down into making sure people understand the numbers and they understand the, the this and the that and, and what you're doing and, and how it all works. And when they're, you know, people want to know what you're going to do with their money and when they're going to get it back. And that's basically like the, the, the initial things. And then from there, everything, you know, you kind of work work out into the things that you're talking about. Yeah. At least that's mm-hmm. what, what we see. I, you know, so- I, I think that, uh, that, 
Hi, this is Casey Brown, host of the Cashflow Pro podcast and YouTube channel. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate but just don't know where to begin? I'd like to help by inviting you to check out our website at www.3000capital.com. There you will find an array of material that will help you learn all about real estate syndication. And while you're there, be sure to check out our free video series download titled Five Must Know Keys to Success in Passive Real Estate Investing. I'd also like to personally thank you for making Cashflow Pro part of your day. Now, back to the show. I want to know a lot more I than what are you going to do with my money and when am I going to get it back? Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, think those are the beginning points of... I mean, it's like, 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 yeah, that's kind of the yeah, essential, kind of yeah. the essential yeah. concept. Yeah. concept. So, so where... Uh, and this is kind of a little bit of reverse of where we usually go because I usually am saying, okay, where do you source your capital from? Where do you source your investors from? If, if we're talking to somebody else that's in the syndicating business, but, but where are you in a mastermind? Do you source, how do you source the, the, even the introduction to some of these operators um, that you're working with or, or, or how have you found the deals that you've invested in? Cause it's obvious that you're not just married to one or two different people as far as, and that sounds kind of weird. That's obvious that you're not just investing with one or two different people. Um, what, what are you, where are you finding these people? Well, I think that, well, I think we, that find, we uh, find partners, partners in, all of our networking in all of our networking scenarios, you know, scenarios, masterminds, mm-hmm. masterminds, conferences, conferences, uh, uh, hearing somebody on a podcast or reaching out, uh, getting uh, on right. email lists. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a ton, ton of ways. I mean, I feel like there's a million ways that I found partners and, and, and found good relationships. I do actually, I do syndicate deals and I also do invest in deal. So I do do both. So I also raise money um, and uh, others um, come from also my networks networks and people that I, that I sure. And yeah, relationships relationships with it's obvious you're, you're hanging out with the money when you say people are putting on investments and you're, you're, you're hanging around money one way or the other where there's money to be invested. And if people don't like this deal, then you might find a deal that they do like or something along mm-hmm. those lines. So yeah, it certainly absolutely. Makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, listen, tomorrow we're kind of running out of time here. So I've got a couple questions that we ask every guest that comes on the show. And, and by the way, your information has been very, uh, almost like pulling the curtain back just to see exactly what goes on in those thoughts, because I I'm really, and I'm kind of refreshed to have a little different angle other than I trust my gut. Not that she was a fabulous guest and she was an attorney and she was, there was a lot of good things, positive things she brought to the show. That was just an unexpected answer. And I was like, oh, okay. So, I, so I guess my, my curiosity level was to what degree are, are other potential passive investors taking this into account or, or how big of a, how big of a play is this piece having in there? So the first question that I ask every guest that comes on the show is what is the best book that you have recently read or are currently reading? Oh, okay. Um, oh, okay. The book that um, I'm reading right now, which I love, is um, the, is, um, the Almanac of, of Naval Ramikov, I believe is his last name. You can Google it. You can Google it. He's an entrepreneur uh, and business, business, successful businessman, and just a really interesting a really guy interesting that kind of started guy doing guy philosophy. Kind of started and doing philosophy and it's a great book. It's about money. So about money. So. Awesome. That's great. All right. What is a dream vacation that you have taken or hope to take? Oh, uh, wow. Well, I just got back from well, Portugal and Barcelona. Portugal that was pretty fun. That was oh, I have a fun. lot more dream I vacations that I want to do. I think sure. uh, one of the, one of the dream vacations, the, that, we vacations that we have now um, is to go to Japan. Uh, we really Japan. wanted to go there for a while really and, for a while. and have, wow. sushi have sushi and explore and the country. Yes. So that's, that's, I tell you the, the plane tickets going West have been just outrageous. The plane tickets going East have up to about a month or six weeks ago have been extremely reasonable. And then if you wanted to go West, when I say West off the coast of California and go on West from there, man, it was just 
poof, outrageous. Yeah, I've seen, but, yeah, the airlines have been yeah, pretty, interesting, pretty in interesting in terms of the shortage that they have and the way they've been running. I haven't had any problems. I always approach situations, same thing with investing, where if I, let's say, you know, everyone's saying, oh my gosh, my plane got canceled and that's so expensive and this and that. I just think, well, I just think, well, I'm going to have a great trip. My plane's going to be on time. My tickets are going to be reasonably priced. It generally works out. Like, generally works it's like out. if you like, let it's anybody, anybody let, let, I lost anybody, money. It's the same thing with investments. Like, I lost money on a deal. 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 No, you're not. I just lost money on a deal. I just mean you're going to lose money on a deal. That's right. That's right. That's right. And I'm always intrigued by the fact that that person can basically do nothing more than log onto the internet and invest fifty thousand dollars in in junk stocks that never amount to anything, and nobody ever has to say a word. And if we want somebody to invest in real property that produces real cash, that produces real profits, we have to disclose, 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 and then have them sign something that says we disclosed all of those. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's again, I, I'm not opposed to it. I think it's great for us. I just, I just to some degree realize it, it's come very apparent, become very apparent to me who, who has control of the money and whoever has control of those markets has control of the money. So Tamar, thank you so much. How can folks uh, reach out and get in touch with you if they've heard something and maybe they even want to look at one of your deals? I mean, if they, because we have investors that pass through here all the time. Um, if we don't have something to, to, to have them look at, we certainly like to pass them on to folks that have been with us. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So oh, my, awesome. Website yeah. So wealth my website is wealthbuildingconcierge.com. And I wrote a book. And I it's wrote called book. The Millionaire's Mentality, a Professional Woman's Guide to Building Wealth to Real Estate. Wealth. You, can you can get that at tamarbook.com. And you can get my quiz on what kind of investor are you at tamarquiz.com. Awesome. And uh, I didn't realize that you uh, had, a, had a book directly uh, uh uh, correlated to, uh, women and women investing yeah. and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, I'm a, I'm a huge, as my guests have probably heard me on past show and it's probably cost me some, some, some listeners and, and even some business and I don't really care, but I'm a huge proponent of women in business and female entrepreneurship. Um, as, uh, my two daughters, uh, kind of, uh, become teenagers, if you will. So pray for me, first of all, <laughs> um, number two, I, I, I just, um, I, I, I want to make it one of my life goals to, to, um, push them to, to, to not only do what they want to do in life and be happy, um, but to, to realize that, Hey, they, they can have a place at the table of business. They can have a place at the table of negotiations and they can have a place in this world that, um, that respects, uh, and, and gives them what they deserve. So awesome. uh, with that being said, awesome. tomorrow, Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thanks. We appreciate Thanks you taking the time. Me, and listeners, as always, please head down and smash that subscribe button and leave us a positive review. Give us five stars if you like what you heard today on the Cashflow Pro or if you like any of the episodes. Please share, 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 and leave us a review. And with that, tomorrow again, thank you. And I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks so much. Cashflow Pro is hosted by Casey Brown, founder and CEO of 3000 Capital, a commercial real estate investment firm committed to providing its investors with ongoing cash flow and helping them build long-term wealth. If you enjoyed today's podcast, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you'll be notified about all our future episodes. You can find more information about us and our investment philosophy by clicking the link in the show notes below. Thanks for listening.